I'm going to bring up Thomas Holt, who asked to be uh, introduced as Thomas Holt, professor at Michigan State University, uh, Broad College Business. And the fact is, uh, his resume is too long to give you anyway. This guy is incredible, is in incredible national and international demand. He's been a friend for a long time, a very good friend, and he's one of those friends who is brilliant, but doesn't have an ego that gets in the way of getting things done. And so we've been very fortunate to partner up with him. And uh, so if I could bring Dr. Thomas Holt up to uh, introduce our speaker today. I think I told Chris something to the effect of just say my name because I wanted to introduce our speaker with a little bit of a longer spiel than normal. Apparently I'm too tall for this one, but I don't want to break it either. Close enough. Uh, so Klaus Fornell is our keynote for today. He is the distinguished uh, Donald C. Cook Emeritus Professor in the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. Uh, in 1994, actually earlier than that is when this whole stuff started, but in 1994 he founded the American Customer Satisfaction Index which is a monthly indicator of the quality of economic output of the United States. Just to give you an idea, we're talking about 250 to 300,000 or so surveys a year. Uh, not uh, exactly 50% of the economy, but almost 50% of the economy. And ACSI is actually the only national cross-industry measure of customer satisfaction. J.D. Powers and others give out the awards, but these guys are, these guys are actually the ones measuring it uh, in a really hardcore way for every industry out there. And for this, he has also received two patents, two use patents for the scientific methodology behind ACSI. And Forrest Morgison, wave to everybody, buddy. Forrest Morgison and that table over there is, I'm going to call it the ACSI team or table for today. Forrest Morgison is the guy who actually runs all this stuff and, and uh, tries to make sense out of it. And obviously, Fornell is the backbone for this company, but several other companies as well. It's going to be a little bit hard to see up uh, on this slide, I guess, because I put a potpourri of everything. We call this the International Business Luncheon. And I think the sort of slide portion in the middle where it says ACSI around the world, that would be your international component for today. But I'm sure Klaus, or Forrest for that matter, can answer any questions related to all of these countries. There are a bunch of different countries where they measure this stuff. I think, if I'm guessing right, they collect something like 70,000 customer service in Singapore. If you know Singapore, it's like five, six million people. It's not very big. So this stuff really uh, carries around the world. Fornell is author of, uh, so I'm an academic, right? I'm uh, at the liberal College of Business. As academics, we always look at citations and the impact and stuff that we read. And Fornell is the author of five of the top 50 most influential papers in marketing science published in our top journals. And his journal marketing article in 2016, the one of a couple, showed that trading based on customer satisfaction alone, which is the topic for today, uh, beats the S&P 500 by a wide margin. Something like, I'm going to round a little bit, but over a 15 year period, 14, 15 year period, this particular index, uh, and it's a true fund, so I'm not selling anything, trying to get you to buy anything, but you can actually buy into an ETF uh, called ACSI if you're interested. But that particular fund, if you look at it for that time period, beat the markets to the tune of 500% increase versus about 40% increase, 35% increase. So uh, there's tremendous power in this stuff as well. And he's got a couple of slides on it that he will talk about. I, I know many of you are interested in customer satisfaction at the true customer level because that's who you're trying to satisfy, of course, to make a profit or make some revenue at the end of the day. But it has a tremendous power on the bottom line performance of firms, too. And I think I'll get into that a little bit. To do this customer satisfaction stuff, Fornell has founded several companies, including CFI Group. That used to be the big time consulting aspect of it. Frankly, it's getting a little bit blurry to me now, but maybe we can do Q&A on that. 4 C Results is a company I believe uh, Fornell sold a, a few years ago. but. Every time you go on a web page and you get a pop-up window asking about satisfaction, which is probably 9 out of 10 times you go somewhere, you can uh, blame or give him credit for that pop-up, whatever they want to play with. And then Exponential ETF is where you can find the ACSI fund with that particular ETF, if you will, plus a couple of others. Uh, all of those companies deal with uh, uh, lots of customer satisfaction at the firm level, but also at the country level a little bit. And if you're interested in that, you can talk to Forrest Morgan about the country level type satisfaction too. 
just to give you a couple of numbers of the sheer power I think exists in uh, what Claus Fornell has done and is doing, there's been some 11,000 articles, a little bit more than 11,000 articles, stuff that I write kind of thing, uh, that have been written about the American customer satisfaction. And it's, clearly I'm talking too long if the slide stuff is uh, losing me here, I guess. Uh, ACSI apparently, according to their promotional team, receives in the billions of annual media impressions. Uh, it regularly appears in all kinds of national media. We have our, our local channel, Channel 6, right? I'm getting confused because Sherry's on both of these channels, so I can't figure out what... But we like saying Channel 6. I'm looking at your table instead of, instead of Sherry up the front. Media everywhere for Fresnel, just to give you a little bit of a potpourri. Bloomberg, CNBC, CNN, NBC, Wall Street Journal, and on and on and on. They get Claude Fresnel to talk about satisfaction and what it means. Uh, so I'm incredibly fortunate to stand here in front of you and have known Claus forever. So I'm fortunate from lots of different angles here today, but I hope all of us are fortunate to welcome Klaus Fornell to uh, the Michigan Business Network luncheon for this particular month. And as you can see, the accolades are not understated. When you have a cover of a magazine that deals with customers uh, widely around the world, and he's the father of customer satisfaction, that probably has a story and lots of accolades to it. Welcome Klaus Fornell to this month. Well, uh, thank you, Thomas, for, for that introduction. Um, I, I, I just had an interesting conversation with, with Sherry, too, what I remembered where I actually come from. And, um, you know, I used to be a spy. Um, right after high school, in the old days, back home in Sweden, it was mandatory to, to do military service. And after a bunch of tests, um, they uh, thought that I was probably good material for the spying business. And that actually was what led me to what I'm doing today. Um, I, w I was looking for unmanned Russian subs in the Baltic that we couldn't really see. So, you know, I treated them as unobservables in a bunch of equations uh, to figure out, you know, what, what they were doing. So I was in the cryptology uh, section of the Swedish military, which was fascinating. I thought we knew a lot more than we uh, told anybody. The Russians, were not all that good. Their codes were easy, or fairly easy to break. I think they're probably better now, as we sort of suspect. The Israelis were really good, but it, it was an interesting international experience. That then led me to an area that I was more interested in in general, which was economics. But in economics, and this is still the case, they never deal with unobservables. They used to, 200 years ago, when uh, measurement was more difficult. But I was interested in, in what they called consumer utility and uh, how to measure it. But in economics, they've given up on that. Anything that is not uh, observed, observed, is, is not taken into account. So uh, utility used to be satisfaction, but is now, and has been for a long time, um, just observing choice, and then draw inferences from that. So I started out as an economist, and, and I was looking at you know, what is it that makes companies valuable? What is it that makes countries uh, rich and um, have economies that, that have a significant rate of growth. 
And traditionally, of course, we, we sort of know the answer to that. It all has to do with productivity, and the more we produce, the more efficient we are, uh, the, the higher the impact is on, on GDP. Um, but that seems to sort of miss the point here. Right? Productivity is not that important in, in a sense, and it's very difficult in a service economy to do unless you focus on the much bigger picture. I mean, it's, it's easy to get I don't know, better productivity in a barber shop, in a hospital, or whatever, by reducing the number of barbers or reducing the number of nurses and uh, have them work you know, quicker. Productivity goes up, but something else probably goes down. And that'd be quality or uh, the various dimensions of quality. So I thought, well, you know, if you have all these measures of um, quantity of economic output, something is missing here. Even, even if we talk about the price index, um, which in, in the U.S. right now is, is um, increasing a little bit, and the Federal Reserve is going all wild about, all right, we got to increase interest rates because of it. Well, I mean, what if, what if prices went up, but quality of the output went up even more? Really? Is that inflation? Probably not. So I had what I thought was a you know, pretty good idea. Let's, let's see if we can't measure quality and put it together with the, the, the various measures of quantity. So that, that was the start, actually, in Sweden, and then uh, some 25 years ago in the United States. And we now have 25 years of data. And um, we can draw a lot of inferences from that. And what I wanted to do in this short talk today is um, just show you some things that, that I've learned that I think are important, not so much in terms of data, but general concepts of how things work and how they don't work, and some, some clear misconceptions about what's going on. So let's start with a law in economics. This is the law of diminishing economic returns, or rate of return, I should probably say. We have this in every economic textbook. Most companies probably get into something that looks like this sooner or later. That is, the more we put in, the worse the rate of, of return given that you're at, at some level of this, right? Now, there are some exceptions when you have economies of scale, it sort of takes off after a while, and, and there are some other ones as well. But what I wanted to start with is, how do we get the opposite? And I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about national economies now, although you can do that as well, but for companies, okay? So this is having an input variable or a company where you can see increasing rates of return. Now, here's one type. I'm going to show you two cases. The first one I think is easy to understand. In economics, we talk about rival goods and non-rival goods. This is what it looks like most often for, ri for non-rival goods. What, what's a non-rival good then? Well, it's easier to talk about or, or understand it if I first e explain what a rival good is. A hamburger is a rival good. If I buy it and I consume it, nobody else can consume it. Right? The same is true with many manufactured products, cars, and, and the like. They don't have this built-in factor that non-rival goods have. And what's a non-rival good then? 
Well, it's something that I consume, but it doesn't impact the consumption of somebody else. You know, movies, books, information in general, and in part that's why we see the, the growth of uh, the whole information technology, right? So I'd rather be in this industry than in any other industry because I have this built-in phenomenon. But we can get it in other ways as well. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The curve looks the same, as it turns out, if you put customer attention in it. That is, at higher levels of customer attention, if you retain 80 or even 90% of, of your customers, it looks like this. If you retain 20%, you know, you're at the low end there. And you have a long, long way to go. So the payoff, paradoxically enough, is higher at higher levels of customer attention, okay? So that's where we're gonna go. Now the starting points, I'm not, I'm not gonna do the, the math, you just have to trust me that this is right. It, I mean, it, it's, it, it is actually simple. You can just you know, convert percentages to probability of customer returning and, and do some present value calculation and, and you get there, right? Now, the next one is understanding power. Where it comes from, who has it, and how to use it. And then there are quite a few unintended consequences that, you know, if you don't think about them, they're, they're sort of difficult to figure out. But let's start with, with power. This is um, Shanghai. I told my graphics artist to put me in that picture and put my hair on fire. So that's what that, that's, that's supposed to look like. If you have been to Shanghai, um, and I know we have gentlemen here that you know, is there often, um, it's sort of difficult to cross the street. I mean, you know, cars and bicycles and motorbikes come from all directions, and um, I, I don't. I was going to say, unless you're careful, you may get hit. But you know, you get hit more often when you're careful. Turns out, and I asked. I have an office in, in Shanghai and one in Beijing. So I asked the head of the office, well, "Why is this? And how how do people sort of work with this?" And his explanation was very simple. He said that, "Well, you know, we haven't had cars for that long. Few few people had cars. Now quite a few more, and it's fairly common to have a, a car in the family. And in the in the old days." The ones who had cars were the powerful. And they could do just about anything, apparently. And that tradition has continued. So even now, when the middle class often has a car, they assume the same power. So in the absence of very strict rules, which we have, which we have in my home country, Sweden, where you, know, you follow the rules, and if you don't, you're in trouble. Here, apparently, you just, if you know who's powerful, then I, you know, I don't for this, uh, then, then you can actually maneuver without hesitation through roundabouts in Shanghai. And I found out Beijing is the same. So that's, that's one thing that we'll, we'll get to in, in later on. The other one is, is another place where I want to spend uh, time. I live in London about... <coughs> one third of the year. And one would think that you're safer. There are lots of bicycles in London, by the way. And the traffic is tough. Are you safer wearing a helmet, do you think? So they actually studied this. And it turns out that at, for bicycles or, or bicyclists with helmets, uh, they have an effect on the drivers of cars. The cars come 3.35 inches closer on average to a, a, a biker with, with a helmet on. Now, I don't know why that is. Maybe they assume that 
the guy has a helmet on, he's gonna stay on the path, and, you know, wiggle around and do crazy things. But that was the average. That has, you know, a distribution around it. So some of the cars came much, much closer. So on, on the overall uh, situation, it's really questionable in London at least if you are safe wearing a helmet. Not because of your actions, but because of how drivers of cars behave. So let's take these two. I'm going to come back to them in a more uh, management economic uh, setting in a while. So to understand power, we can look at the movement of these things. Information, capital, and work. And I'd say not labor. The labor is not moving around. But work is, as we all know. And it creates unemployment problems here and there in, in various countries. But it's pretty easy to figure out how they affect the buyer-seller relationship. Who's getting more choice? Who's becoming more replaceable? That obviously has something to do with who's gaining power, who's losing power. The buyer is getting more choice because of it. The seller is becoming more replaceable. Now, my guess is that this will continue in the future, but who knows? Uh, you know, it, it may stop and, and, and not not proceed in the same pay, at the same pace that we've seen so far. But it, all, all the indications are that the, the buyers are getting more powerful for quite a few reasons, and sellers are not. Now, if you talk about the employees, they are the big losers. They are, are losing power in just about every country that you can think of these days. Now, this is, this is a bit of a leap because I don't think people think in this, these terms in general. I mean, what, what does this have to do with anything that I just talked about? Well, it has a tremendous impact on the value or valuation of companies. If you go back to 1975, 83% of a company's value was reflected pretty much in his balance sheet. Today, I only have data here from uh, 2015, but I, I don't think it's changed all that much. The pace here has probably dropped off a little bit. But now we have a situation where, you know, just about all the value, not all, but almost all the value of companies. We're talking about the stock market here. These are the S&P companies, the 500 companies are determined by intangible assets. What's an intangible asset? Well, some of them are in fact on the balance sheet, like goodwill and patents and, and things like that. But most of them are not. I would go so far as to say that all assets that a company has must be reflected somehow in the health of its customer base which is measured by the satisfaction of the customers. I mean, that's where it has to end up. So customer satisfaction is probably a reasonable proxy, summary proxies, proxy for all a company's assets. Now, to prove the point, and, and Thomas uh, alluded to this, that you should first read the, the fine print. <laughs> this, this is, this is something that the lawyers always force you to do. And I, I will explain it to you, but, but you know, not, not in great detail. This is 12 years back, I think. This is the S&P 500. Now, I'm gonna take this slowly. The S&P 500, you all know what it is. I'm not sure you all know how it's constructed. In fact, I didn't know until recently that there was a little quirk in there, but anyway, <clears throat> overall, it is the market capitalization, the market cap of a company weighted, right? 
So the, the size in the index of, let's say, uh, Amazon or uh, <coughs> Google or those companies is, is huge. And the companies at the lower end, those that are 400 or 500, is much lower. So it's capital weighted, market capital weighted. And, you know, as, as somebody, I'm not the financial economist, by the way. I sort of understand it a little bit, but I sort of wonder, what, you know, why, why would you do this? But this is the, the most, the dominating measure of uh, the U.S. stock market. You could talk about the Dow as well, but uh, even though it's more uh, common in mass media, it's, it's so limited by what, I think it's 32 companies or something like that. So that's how that goes. So then you could, you could sort of ask the following question. What if you used, instead of market cap, use another weighting mechanism, another way to do this? And of course, you know, I would then think of customer satisfaction. So as, as Thomas said, we've had this now for 25 years. Uh, uh, we have companies that they each get a score from zero to 100 on, on a customer satisfaction scale. So I have all these numbers. So instead then of, of doing, you know, what the S&P does, what if I just take the weight from my satisfaction scores and invest accordingly, right? What do I get? I'm not making this up. You know, it, all of you can probably take that number, 300 and I can't even read, 332 from here, it looks like, percent. That's 27% per year. Who gets that return? I mean, you know, it's almost unheard of, right? That's why I have this legal sort of thing at the end there, or at the bottom. It, it really is this, this type of effect that we're seeing. The, um, the legalese here has to do with the fact that um, not all of this was done before the market, so some of it is back-tested. But in this case, in this case, the back test is sort of irrelevant. It's just a formula, right? I just plug in the uh, the weights from the ACSI and throw out the S and P weights, and this is what I get. Now, I, I do run, as Thomas said, an, an ETF and I had a hedge fund before this and so forth, and uh, I'm not I'm not trying to do. It. I think I'm not trying to do this. Sell it here, but you know, it's it's almost too good. To be true and this is the power or the reflection of the power of the customer and the power of uh, customer satisfaction now why what's the mechanism you may wonder what what does this happen well it's easy first of all on the average there are always exceptions to this rule but on the average companies that satisfy their customers tend to be more profitable big surprise but that doesn't explain everything here, right? They are more profitable, but it also turns out that in part because of this, they are also having more earnings surprises. And if you have a positive earnings surprise, your stock price usually goes up right after the earnings are reported each quarter, okay? So let me then move to some, some implications, not for the financial markets, but for, for managers and companies. And I always thought it was, it's easier to, to sort of talk about what not to do first, and then on what to do. Well, you can always buy, you can always buy customer loyalty. I mean, you, you, you can buy, the loyalty of anybody, you know, whether it's in politics or in, in wars or, or whatever. In the long term, it's obviously not the, the smartest strategy uh, because it's, it's, it's unsustainable, right? Um, 
This often happens in, in the recessions because you have no choice. But if you have a choice, you know, once you start the cost cutting program, be very careful so your customer relationships are not damaged at the same time. This is a popular thing. I don't understand it, but you know, uh, more companies than I have seen ever before rely on very, very quick feedback from their customers, either via social media or quick surveys, or these kiosks that you have uh, here and there in various retail stores or in airports and so forth. Now, the information, the value of that information is limited. It has very little predictive power, and this we can go back, you know, there's fairly uh, well-known research by Nobel Prize winning economist, Donald Kahneman, certainly one of them, that, that shows that, well, it's not the instant reaction that is predictive, it's what the individual, in this case the customer, remembers that is predictive. This is not to suggest that one should not necessarily collect instant feedback because there may be something that's seriously wrong and you need to fix it. But in general, as a predictive piece of information, it is not all that helpful. Another thing uh, that makes little sense is to ask customers what they want us, meaning, in meaning uh, a company, to improve. You always get some version of lower price and higher quality. And then it's so, sort of a given. We know how to do this. It's, you know, it's not terribly difficult. It's somewhat mathematical. But you have to figure out what's the relationship between what you're offering now and what the customer thinks of it. And then look at the slope of that thing. It's technical, I know it sounds like, but is really quite simple. And, and that could, could be done by, I think, a good statistician. Another thing you should not do is reduce the number of customer complaints. Why not, people say. Well, you know, just, just think about it. What is more costly not to receive a complaint and have the customer leave? Or to receive the complaint, maybe do something about it and maybe prevent whatever happened to happen again. I mean, it's pretty clear once you do the financial analysis of this that this, this is not smart. It also is, it creates some organizational issues. I've seen companies where some executives and even staff people are uh, having bonuses computed on the number of complaints that the company receives, well, you know, probably not the smart idea. This is what you should do. All right. It should be what to do now. I don't know what happened there. There you go. Okay, uh, so this is what you do. Well, I mean, this sounds sort of obvious, but you know, you have you have to work for it. And by just reducing price or something like that, it's probably not worth it. I I mentioned this in the beginning. Balance productivity and service quality. It's very very easy to take the wrong step here, trying to be in, and particularly if you're in the service industry to have each individual do more, or do it faster, or whatever. Uh, I mean, in some cases it could work, but, but usually it has an unintended cost associated with it. And this is what I just said. I mean, th this industry is actually growing. I don't understand why. Maybe because it's nice to get uh, very, very quick feedback, but the value of that information is limited. I'm not saying it's worthless, but it's limited. Cost and effect analysis. Um, 
is what you have to do. There are statistical techniques for it. There are other techniques out there as well. Um, unfortunately, I see too many companies that don't do any of this. They just collect massive data and then uh, you know cut it in terms of this type of customer, that type of customer, and, and, and uh, that type of problem. And that doesn't really lead anywhere. So it's not very high quality, I, I'd say, for the most part uh, today. And I go so far as to say that you should maximize the number of customer complaints. Not by making your customers unhappy. I mean, that's the only caveat to that. But otherwise, encourage people to speak out, complain, and, you know, learn from it and fix it. And again, the reason for that is that's a cheaper and more effective way than have a dissatisfied customer not complain and leave the company. I mean, it's, you know, fairly easy, but not the easiest thing to do. And I just want to close with this again. I've taken out the, the middle portion, and I don't have it quite up to date. But, you know, to go from <coughs> intangible uh, values being 17% of the S&P companies in 1975 to 84% in 2015, I mean, that really suggests that we need to adjust our management drastically. And if we behave as companies did in 1975, uh, you know, unless we have a monopoly. So the only exception, I think, to what I just said across the board is that if you are lucky enough to operate in a monopoly, forget everything I said, you know, but that doesn't apply. All right, that, that was my short sort of lecture for today. If there are questions, I'll be happy to try to, to answer. Thank you very much. This was very informative information. My question, or maybe comment, is more about the loyalty factor as um, the generations that are coming behind us, they don't have the same loyalty factor as we did and, and like my parents and things of that nature. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. And so what would you say to that with regards to that loyalty factor? And, because that might speak to why companies now are wanting that instant gratification, that instant survey information, instant feedback. Because you have to get it while you can because they're gone. Yeah. No, I, th I think uh, that that's right, that the whole concept of loyalty has, has changed over the years. Um, 50, 60, 70 years ago, uh, there were at least two things that were different. The consumers, the buyers, didn't have as much choice, not as many alternatives. And in many cases, they also had more personalized service. So both of those things led to a higher degree of loyalty. Now, to try to get instant feedback in order to improve loyalty, yeah, I think you know, it, it, has, it has a function, but it's not all that powerful. Because it if we're talking about stuff you buy daily, maybe, but otherwise it's determined by the <coughs> purchase cycle, the rate of which you you know you buy a car every three to five years or whatever it is. Then the key is to have data about how satisfied or dissatisfied that customer is around the time it is relevant to think about for the, that customer to think about. <coughs> trading in the old car for a new one. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your remarks. 
Uh, the question I have is, do you have or have you found a reliable uh, predictor or measure that you can glob onto to measure customer satisfaction? I think, for instance, of like net promoter score, which is something that I know we're tracking. Um, are, are there measures like that that you find to be reliable predictors of this? Yes, and I hate to tell you, it's not net promoter. Um, just to, and, and net, the net promoter score, which, which has been successfully um, marketed and, and been adopted by many, many companies, I find to be near a random variable. And the reason for that is that you, you take a perfectly good scale, I think it's one to 10. And then you say everybody that scores, I think above seven or so, you take those, you lump them together and you take everybody that has a score whatever, below three or four or something. Yeah. And you, and, and you take the difference of those two and say, up, oh, this is my NPS score. What, what does that tell you? There, there are many ways on that scale that I can get to the same num number, and it has a completely different interpretation, right? And so I don't, I don't whoever came up with that method knows very little about the index construction. So I don't, I don't, See, I don't understand why companies are using it. I don't see how it's predictive. It's not really about satisfaction. It's about uh, you know, telling others what uh, you like, I suppose. And you know, in social media, that has an effect, but the, the index itself is, is a mishmash, right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, no, th you, th that's, a, that's a good remark there. I mean, it's sold on its simplicity. You only have to ask one question. Um, but you just to, b before I answer that, I mean, if you take a perfectly good scale and make it into a binary, I'm not trying to be technical, but I think conceptually everybody, even a non-mathematician can understand this. Take 10-point scales, make it into binary, either you're, you're a promoter or you're a, not a promoter, uh, what you have done is you have thrown away most of the information that is contained on that scale. So what's a better measure? Well, I, I think, you know, uh, I can claim that a good measure of customer satisfaction along the lines of what we uh, have in the American Customer Satisfaction Index is much more predictive, uh, much, much, uh, more stable and much more precise. So, I I can give you literature on that. You can look me up, or uh, you know there, there are many people here that, that can answer that question. But it, I think a good measure of customer satisfaction is is much to prefer uh, in favor of something that looks very simple, but is really very simplistic and doesn't really help you out. Is the earnings per share a measure of satisfaction? Among the investors, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, you had an excuse, Ron. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, earnings per share is, is, it's not clear to me how predictive it is. Right now, that number is pretty high for the stock market, but I, I would not, man, I, I don't predict these things, but I would not predict, uh, you know, a um, stock market crash or even a fall or maybe, who knows about corrections, but I sort of like the EPS number as, as a general measure of what, a share, what the price of a share is, but it's not in isolation, I think it's, sort of risky to look at. You gotta look at all the other companies that uh, you know are in the same category, uh, historical data, and the predictive power is, I think, low. And it's also something that everybody has access to. 
So I thought there was going to be a question on, you know, if, if we're able to make so much money on, on the ACSI ETF, you know, how come others don't do it? And that, that, I think that's a very, very good question. But I, I think the answer is, I'm not sure about this, but I think it is that most financial analysts, they don't look at things like this. They don't look at customer satisfaction. They, they do look at EPS though. Uh, and other types of measures. So I'm sort of with the financial analysts, or, or at least the academic part of, of, of finance that would say, you know, you can't really beat the market unless you know something that the other guys don't. And that's, I think, is the major reason for why, why we have this result. Thank you for sharing this graph. I look at this and you talk about the tangible versus intangible. And I think about the fact that companies in 215, 218, you know, there's maybe less bricks and mortar, more technology. I think that that's kind of reflected in that. But I was curious your thoughts regarding, you talk about customer satisfaction and you know, the different surveys, blah, 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 things like that. How do you think that technology has impacted the organization's ability to get true customer satisfaction and, and that data and the interpretation of it and how it affects the bottom line? Well, it, you know, the, I, I think there, there are two dimensions, at least two dimensions to that. You know, one, is, uh, one is good, one is bad. The, the good one is that we now have technology to move data and collect data. And we can do that very quickly. And it's not terribly expensive to do. But we have sort of been overeating this stuff. So we have probably more data than we need, more um, low quality data, and we have far too little analysis of it. We collect and we transmit and we slice and dice the data. But it's not clear to me that we're any, smart, any smarter because of it. So I'd like to, you know, I'm old enough to look at the good old days way back, but I'd like for us to go back and start applying the statistical techniques, the multivariate statistics where we can say something about cause and effect, not perfectly, but, you know, pretty darn close, and actually not only predict the future reasonably well, but also to say, do X and why will likely follow. Where why probably is, you know, some either loyalty, profit, revenue, whatever. And X is some action you can take. Over the last five or 10 years with the growth of technology, have you seen a decline in customer satisfaction overall? Um, I think that that's kind of- Yeah, I mean, that, that, that should be the consequence of what I'm saying. But everything is always more complicated. So you remember the first two graphs? Where I talk about diminishing returns. And again, I think, I mean, the, the, the way we, can, we now can collect data and the IT technology we have, we should have seen a greater increase in customer satisfaction overall. When we look at the ACSI, we still see an increase and then a dip and then a little increase. And you know, it's either going to be that way if we don't use the data in a smart way, or, but I, I see little uh, evidence of this yet, or that markets are becoming more monopolistic. You know, the internet, who knows with the destruction of net neutrality will do. I, I think not necessarily so good. There's some um, industries that are less sensitive to what the customers want. I would put airlines in that category. Uh, I would put, um, you know, some of the cable companies in that category. And they're not punished for it. So, there are, I, I think those are exceptions though. But you're right, we, we should, see it in the overall customer satisfaction, but what I'm saying is not all that 
obvious how to interpret it. I can say that I should have seen a greater increase. Others would have said, well, you should see a decline in satisfaction. We're not seeing a decline overall, but we're not seeing much of an increase either. I, uh, I just said, Klaus, you can always tell the success of a presentation by the number of questions. And I have a feeling you could be here till 3.30 today. Great information. Thank you so much for coming up. Um, you want to make sure on your calendar, September 4th, that's our next presentation, our next luncheon. Uh, we're going to feature uh, uh, Wei Peng. Wei Peng, I'm sorry. Wei Peng is the director of M-City in Ann Arbor. Autonomous vehicle, so we'll get up to date. Uh, really well up to date uh, with that presentation. Again, I want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, they're in your program, etc. Uh, our photographer, Dave Trumpy. Uh, don't forget you can go online, get anything that happened here uh, off uh, michiganbusinessnetwork.com. I want to thank my team, because I always, I, I never thank them enough. Jeff Mosier, and Mike Steibel, uh, Jeff McCowan, uh, Chris Geiger, who's not here, and Sarah Mosier. So I, I take a round of applause. They, they really work hard to make these comments. <laughs> and Klaus, I'm sorry I didn't consult you before this, but you have a customer uh, comment card on your, on your table. Please fill them out. There's two easy questions, and we just want some direction as far as the value of this and what is going on. We'd like to continuously improve if we can. Um, again, all this information is on michiganbusinessnetwork.com. Thank you all so much for being here and all you do for our community to make it the great place that it is and ever striving to make it greater. Have a prosperous month.